Guys, I am so excited about today's CW pod here on Iowa Everywhere. There are um, you know, people in life who are really good at what they do, and then there's people who are transcendent. I believe the guy joining me on today's podcast is the most important, the most influential person in the history of the sport of football. I, I mean, I know it's a huge statement, but he is the inventor, the godfather of the air raid offense. He discovered Mike Leach, uh, Dana Holgerson. This is his coaching tree. Sonny Dykes, Art Bryles, Cliff Kingsbury, Will Muschaff, Chris Hatcher, Hal Mummy, the legend uh, former uh, started the name for himself here in our state, Iowa Wesleyan. And he joins me today to talk about the formation of the air raid offense and uh, some great memories with his dear friend and one of my um, you know favorite sports figures ever, that being Mike Leach. And it was just a, it was everything I wanted it to be. Uh, I, I told I told Naden, who produces the show last week, I go, this is like interviewing Michael Jordan for me. And he was great. We went for about 50 minutes. I could have gone for four hours because I have, um, I'm just so fascinated by this man. You know, you in the sport of football back in the seventies, the eighties, everybody's just running it. And all of a sudden you've got this guy from Texas who says, we're just going to pass all the time. And people looked like, looked at him like he had 10 heads. They made fun of him. They mocked him. And now you look around today and the vision of Hal Mummy and Mike Leach is everywhere in the college game. You turn on Sundays, NFL systems are running it, and this guy is a treat. I felt like I was talking to Mike Leach. I uh, hope you enjoy it. I want to thank our friends at the uh, Channel Seed Studios for sponsoring the Chris Williams podcast here on Iowa Everywhere. Of course, Circa Sportsbook. Um, don't forget, we've got the golf coming up this weekend with the Open Championship. Great golf lines with Circa. And um, they, that's where they really, really stand out. So if you haven't downloaded the Circa Sports Iowa app yet, I would encourage you to do so in time for the Open Championship coming up this weekend. All right, guys. I hope you enjoy this as much as I did. Here's my interview with the great Hal Mummy. Um, we'd love to tell you what this podcast is about. But the truth is, we don't know. The CW Pod, at home on Iowa Everywhere. From the Channel Seed Studios, this is Iowa Everywhere. Channel Seed, seedsmanship at work. And hello, welcome to a super special installment of the CW Pod. If you guys have been listening to me for however long, you know that um, there's a couple of guys who... I kind of like him. I'm kind of a disciple of the Hal Mummy way of football, and I'm so excited that the legendary, the Godfather of the Air Raid, is here to join us on today's podcast. And uh, Coach, I don't get very nervous. I've been doing this a long time. I've interviewed a lot of people. I was kind of nervous to talk to you today because I, I read the book about you. I've, um, I've just, I love your your approach to football and life, and it's something I've kind of tried to model my media career off of cutting against the grain a little bit. So it's a real honor to have you on the show here. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate all those words too. Well, you are, um, you know, you're fascinating in so many ways. You are the godfather of the air raid offense and I'm a big 12 guy. Okay. So <laughs> a lot of years where, um, my, my league style of football would kind of get made fun of by the people, the, the Iowa fans specifically in the big 10. Oh, that's not real football and all this stuff. And you're really the guy who, who, who came up with all of it is, is how it all went down. And I'm just so fascinated by Iowa Wesleyan college back in the, was that in the seventies when you guys no, got the Iowa Wesleyan? The, uh, it was in the, uh, 89 through 91. Okay. 89 through 91, you had at that point been kind of a journeyman. You'd been bouncing around um, high schools. You had been at UTEP, I know, before. And you show up in our state. How did you get to Iowa Wesleyan? And then I want to get to bringing on Mike Leach and Dana Holgerson and all that. But how did you end up in our state, Coach? Well, they had – the program there was so bad that 
they offered it to nearly every high school coach in the state of Iowa. <laughs> so they had to move the high school coaches out of Iowa. And I had a friend named Steve Kazor who was the he's a he's in pro football, has been in pro football his, nearly his whole life. But he he was at that point the special teams coach for Mike Didka at the Bears, and he knew the president at Iowa Wesleyan. And so, you know, one thing, you know, how you do it, you kind of network and, and, uh, one thing led to another and, and, uh, they invited me up for an interview and I turned it down the first time they offered it to me because it was just so bad. And then they, they went out and tried to hire some other guys. And about a month later, they called me back and, uh, and we talked some more and we came to terms and, and I took the job. I read the the book Perfect Pass by S.C. Gwynn. I've actually read it twice. Um, it's kind of becoming a tradition. I read it before football season to get me kind of fired up for the year. Thank well, you. And S.C.'s a great writer. He's a great historian. He's a good become a good friend too. What did you think about the book? Did it portray everything you wanted it to as far as your your career? I thought S.C. did a, as good a job as you could do. Uh, it's it's a long story and and. You know, he writes history. Yeah. In fact, he's uh, currently, they're going to announce one of his books is going to be done by Taylor Sheridan. And, uh, oh, uh, wow. It, it's going to become a series. It's the one about Quanta Parker, The Empire of the Summer Moon, which I had already, when he contacted me, I'd already read Empire of the Summer Moon, and it was just a fabulously written history. Uh, Sam has this real talent for taking history and then writing it so it becomes like it's like reading a novel you know and and so i was very flattered when he wanted to do our story well the this is another reason why i wanted to have you on coach because i i think that your story is fascinating from the research i've done it it's similar um sc gwen kind of wanted to tell the story of you for the same reason that that I wanted to have you on because I'm, I love Mike Leach. You and coach Leach are two of my three, like favorite sports figures of all time. Okay. Well, um, you. I'm not just buttering you up. I just, I love guys and, and gals who will just do things differently, who they yeah. don't, you don't have to do it the same way as everybody else. You can be weird. You can have your own interests. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, so you have this, massive coaching tree in fact by the way uh i did talk to dana holgerson last week at big 12 media oh, awesome. days yeah he told me that you you and leach kicked him out of the air egg because he's running the ball too much is that true <laughs> he says that all the time because he, <laughs> he 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 does he's got his own innovative approach to it but of course not he's, he's <laughs> one of the guys he's always been but dana's got kind of that uh very sarcastic sense of humor and so He'll, uh, you know, he'll he'll surprise you sometimes with what he says. He surprised me the first time I ever met him. I went to, uh, I'd been on the job about two days at Mount Pleasant, and I went to see the great Bob Evans, who was at Mount Pleasant High, the the high school coach. And and you know, if you're going to recruit, you always ought to start with the local guys, right? So I went over there. I heard they had had this kid that got kind of overlooked. It was really a good receiver. And, I went in, Bob told me all about him and his family and everything. And he said, you want to talk to him? I said, sure. And so I, Bob gets this, this little staff worker there and says, go get Dana Holgerson out. He's in English class right now. And so we sat there for about another 20 or 30 minutes and Dana never showed up. Finally, Bob looks at, at this little worker and goes, what did you take that message to Dana Holgerson? And she goes, yeah, he said he didn't want to talk to Iowa. So he would rather stay <laughs> So he went to another school for the first year and they tried to turn him into a defensive back. And in January, I looked, I was sitting at my desk in my office and, and I looked up and there's Dana standing in the doorway and he goes, can I transfer? And I said, by all means. <laughs> yeah, we'll take you. He, he became a great player for us. So, and, uh, you, so you have like this, this, this Iowa Wesleyan deal. I, I want to paint a picture because it actually is historic. The, the school just closed down. Yeah, I know. I've, I've been keeping up with it. It's very sad. Yeah, so the school is closed down. This is for, for all the Iowans who are listening. 
coach, and you yeah. get there. They have, like, maybe the worst program in the country. They didn't even have, like, facilities, right? You guys, your your office is in, like, the basement of a gymnasium or something first, like that. Uh, the first six months on the job, we didn't even have that. I had to share an office with a women's basketball coach. <laughs> really? Yeah. And so I looked around in the place for a place to have a football office because – you know, you got to have a place for your staff to work, too. It's not just about having one single office, which that's what they had. So I went to the AD, and I said, y'all got this down there in the basement. There's this, like, boiler room. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's pretty large, and it's other than steam pipes going over the top, we could turn it into an office. I said, could we turn that into the football office? And so we did, and we put up, we put up I think, let's see, one, two, three, put up about five walls and walled it into an office for me, a tiny little lobby for a secretary and uh, an entrance, and then a, a staff room with two offices for the two coordinators off of that. And, and it, yeah, it had steam pipes going through. One of, <laughs> the coordinators had steam pipes going through their offices. <laughs> they had a duck to get to their desk. Blue collar as it comes right there, man. Yeah, and they, you know, the only light was there's, there was like two of those uh, little basement window wells, you know, that would fill up with snow in the wintertime. Uh, <laughs> but we, we turned it into a workplace. It was definitely a workplace. So you, you bring in Mike Leach as your offensive coordinator. From what I understand, you didn't really know him, right? It's not no, like you guys he, were. He was, he was uh, I went to. I brought my defense coordinator from the high school I was at in Texas, Copper's Cove. And he took a huge cut in pay to come, but he wanted to coach in college, just like me. I mean, we both took big cuts in pay. And I had to hire somebody for $12,000 to be the offensive line coach. And I tried to talk to some of the line coaches that I knew and they all turn it down. You know, in 1989, if you told an offensive line coach that you wanted him to play out of a two-point stance, have huge wide splits, and uh, back off the ball about about as far as you could, uh, and that you were going to throw the ball 50 times a game, most of them would walk out of the room before the conversation ended. <laughs> so Yeah. Uh, I, I decided I just wanted to hire the smartest person I could find, and then I'd teach him how to how I wanted to play. And that's, that's what I did. And Mike, Mike was one of the few guys that really researched things and, and found out that I, that this coach at Iowa thing wanted to play like BYU did. Cause mm-hmm. that was, we copied Lavelle and, and, uh, and so he sent me a resume and I saw the BYU on his resume. And so I called him and we just started to struck up this conversation that went on for about two months. And I said, look, why don't, why don't you meet me at BYU? I'm going to go out there and <clears throat> study the offense like I always do in the spring in April. Why don't you meet me there for the week, and, and we'll see if we can get along if we like each other. And so he did, and, and so I, I offered him the job. So, and then I made him the coordinator the second year after the after the. First. Okay. Wasn't he – wasn't Leach, like, coaching some team in, like, Finland or something he too was, for a while? Well, he, he had gone to law school – Sharon is such a great person, his wife, and uh, he goes to law school, racks up all these bills, these student loans, and he, he's a brilliant guy. I mean, you yeah. know, you interviewed him, you, you can know that just talking to him. Uh, he comes home and he tells Sharon, I don't want to be a lawyer, I want to be a football coach. So he goes to Cal Poly and volunteers for a season and, and substitute teaches. And then he says, I need to get a master. So he goes down to the U.S. Sports Academy in Mobile, Alabama for like a summer, a spring and a summer. Uh, he he uh, gets his master's in PE or something like kinesiology, I guess. And and then he goes back and they, get, they find him a job at the College of the Desert, which is a junior college in in uh down by palm springs 
So he goes there and he coached. He was that's what he was doing when I hired him. He was coaching defense, and they were paying him like six or eight thousand dollars a year, and he had to watch the rec gym at night. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I I was the only guy that could hire. He was the only guy I could hire where I doubled his salary, and he there you go. got to coach offense. So I, I did the interview, offered him the job, he accepted it. And then he says, I said, now, look, this is just a formality, but you got to come back to Iowa and, and do this little dog and pony show with the admissions director and the vice presidents and the AD and all that. I said, but I get, I've got it in my car. I get to pick the staff, so I'm picking you. And, and he, he goes, well, I, I can do that. He said, I got one other thing. He said, I got an opportunity. They want, want me to be the head coach of Pori, Finland. <laughs> and, and I said, well, okay, that's fine when is that and he goes well i, I i'll be done on august 1st i said oh. i'd be okay you could you could do that they'd probably be happy happy they don't have to pay you till then anyway and uh so he comes back and he, he about a month later he comes to mount pleasant and he goes through does the uh the uh dog and pony show with the ad and the, the admissions director it takes all day i mean he goes they run him around campus to one committee to another you know like they do at small colleges. Yeah. And uh, somewhere around the, the end of the day, the AD comes, stands in my office door, and I said, well, how's he doing? What do you all think? And he goes, nobody likes him. No <laughs> David, well, Johnson, David Johnson was a great guy. I really I love that guy. But he, uh, I said, well, uh, I'm going to hire him anyway. <laughs> so you – Correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I have always under the way I've always understood it is, I mean, you guys like you're kicking butt, like you're beating D two teams, you're you're setting all these records. People are showing up yeah. for games, and then they let you go basically because the the community was putting too much of an emphasis on football. Now is that is that accurate to a point? Yeah, I think the real reason uh, was they. They, when I got to campus, there was one black person on the entire campus. Yep. And and I think we brought in, you know, about probably a third of our football team was was African American, and, and another third of it was Polynesian. We brought in a bunch of Polynesian players, and I I just think the culture shock uh, offended some of the board members. It wasn't the president. It wasn't Dr. Prince. He they made him the bad guy, but he he didn't want to do it. But at our third season there, we had run, we had won so many games so fast the first year that nobody wanted to play us. Yeah. They, you got kicked they, out of that conference, right? Well, yeah, well, the conference is only one year old, and we were the patsy of the thing. When I went to the first conference meeting, everybody was glad-handing me because <laughs> I was going to be everybody's homecoming game. Yeah. And, and uh, the next year, David and I go into the conference meeting and sit down, and they, they look at us, and they go, well, the first order of business is to vote I Wesleyan out of the conference. Because <laughs> you're so, hanging 50 on them all the time. Yeah, yeah. well, we beat the, the, you know, the first year we beat Lakeland, which was supposed to be the conference champion. and We played Greenville, which was the other great power in the league, and we played them down to the, the last play of the game and ended up losing, I think, 48-47 in a, a game that people still talk about in that area. Uh, so anyway, they vote us out of the conference, and they, some of them elected not to play us the following season. So I had like three or four gaps in the schedule. And for the season after that, hardly any, only I think Greenville still played us, and Concordia in Wisconsin still played us, but uh, all the rest of them dropped us. So there I am where – we're independent. I got to fill the schedule. And so the only teams I could find to play were all uh, Division Two type teams. A lot of them are FCS teams now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, the second year we ended up, wasn't, it wasn't as good as the first year. The first year we went to the Steamboat, we, we created a bowl game for ourselves in Burlington. In Burlington, and, Iowa? Yeah, and then that, that came about because my defensive coordinator, Mike Major, went to Burlington. He was single, and so he would go to Burlington all the time because there was more women in Burlington than there oh, was. Oh, of course. And, and so <laughs> he got to be friends with some of the business guys over there, 
and it helped us because we ended up recruiting some of their sons to play for us. Oh, great. But, but they said, you know, y- y'all should bring this over here to this is about halfway through the first season. He comes to my office and says, they, those guys want us to play a game in Burlington. I said, really? So yeah, they want, they're hearing about all this, you know, how we're playing and everything. And they're all shocked that I West is actually winning games yeah. <laughs> and then they're here. The style of play is they're curious about it. And so I started checking the NAI rules and I realized that you can have bowl games. You, know, you just got to have somebody, they didn't have many of them. They had one or two around the whole nation because they could only, it was whatever a community wanted to do for you. But at the end of the season, they could invite you to a bowl if you didn't make the playoffs. And the only stipulation was you had to have a winning record. Well, we were obviously already had that. So yeah. for about a month there in the first season, we worked and put together what they call the Steamboat Classic. And the first year, the United Way uh, sponsored it. And we made it kind of a charity deal. And we went over and we played Lambeth College in the first week in December. In that little in that little rock bowl stadium they have in Marla, in uh, Burlington, which is really kind of a scenic place, and uh, yeah, was, so we we went to that bowl game. The second year, everybody thought, well, they'll, we'll make the playoffs this year because we got everybody back. But what they didn't realize was how hard our schedule had become. Yeah, and and uh, oh, we we had some absolute. Uh, devastating losses to begin the year we had to play morningside which was a really pretty good d2 program and and uh portland state which was the number one team in the nation in d2 and we played those guys because they paid us and they paid for the trips um and then we kind of rebounded and we ended up winning uh we ended up winning seven and and uh actually got one of the the morningside loss we got that back because they had that played a bunch of ineligible players against us. So we, we ended up technically winning eight uh, and went to the Steamboat Bowl again. And then the third year, that's how Air Raid, what everybody knows is Air Raid now that they see on TV. That's the third year is when that really started. Uh, the first year we were still, didn't even run the shotgun. We were still under the center. We looked just like BYU. Okay. The second year, we put the shotgun in, but we didn't play fast. We still played out of the huddle. And then the third year, uh, Mike and I are sitting there looking at the schedule. And by this time, he and I had become buddies, and we had made a lot of trips together just to learn stuff. You know, mm-hmm. anybody that was throwing the ball, we wanted to go visit them. And so we're sitting there looking at our schedule. And I'm going, look, we got an All American quarterback back. We got two All American receivers back. We got your whole offensive line back. We got our running back, who it was a thousand yard rusher back. And we might win three games because <laughs> the schedule is just brutal. Mm-hmm. And and I said we need an edge. And so I said find us. I looked up at that window. We're sitting in that staff room. I looked at that window. Well, it's February. And it's filled up with snow, and it's about eight degrees outside. You Iowans are incredibly tough people. <laughs> we're, cold. we're crazy. Yeah, and and uh, I said, find us somebody to recruit in Florida. We need a we need an edge. We need to go get some ideas. And and so Mike, me and Mike, he finds a kicker in Key West. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hell yeah! President, and I said we got to we can we need to go to Florida for a recruiting trip. And, but I only had enough money to go to Orlando. <laughs> so we uh, we get to Orlando, and Mike says, you know, they got a spring league going on, and I know some of the coaches on it. Well, you want to go watch them practice? I said, yeah, sure. So we go over there, and that's where uh, the great Don Matthews, who ended up winning, I think, six or seven Grey Cups in Canada, he was the coach of this Orlando team. And he welcomed us and let us hang out with the team all day and go to the meetings and sit in watch them get ready and and we were walking out to practice and I said coach Matthews what's y'all's best drill and and I really thought he was going to tell me like a quarterback drill or something like that and and he he says uh watch bandit drill at the end that's when we work on two minute offense and so we get out there and we watch practice and it's kind of a normal pro practice you know but they get to the end to bandit drill and 
it was I'd seen two minute offenses practice before, but I'd never seen it done this efficiently and this uh, perfect. And they had it. They had the offense on one sideline and the defense on another sideline, and they had the kickers and the punters spotting the ball. And and they they would run a play, and, and then the ball would be moved ten yards, and and they already have the ball set before the last previous play was over with. And then they they would hustle up there and they'd do their subbing, and it would you know basically look like one of our games now. Mm. And and I looked at Mike and I said, "There's our edge." And he goes, yeah, we're going to do it all the time, aren't we? And I go, yeah, we are. <laughs> Did, so that's, okay, so that's how it started. When you started in football, though, like, it was just basically, I mean, there was this, there was this thought from, you correct me if I'm wrong, sir, because I'm, I'm no, by no means an expert on this, but there was this thought that it was just a terrifying thing to throw the football because it's so dangerous to put the ball in the air. And well, I'm from I'm from Texas, and and I grew up in the playing in the late '60s and to, through the mid '70s, and and uh, you know Daryl Royal was kind of the kingpin of yeah, but the wishbone, Emory Ballard, that whole deal, and their their famous saying, which was really just kind of a quip by Daryl, that was funny because he was a lot like Coach Leach and very dry sense of humor, but but somebody asked him about why he'd only thrown the ball one time during the game. And, and he said, you know, there's three things that could happen when you pass, and two of them are bad. And uh, which, you know, you can basically, if you think about it logically, you can say the same thing about running the ball. <laughs> where did where did the air raid? I know how we get there, and we'll I'll, I'll walk you through that. But we, where within you, right? You're you're yeah. this young guy, this young coach. Where did the rebel, I guess, come from? Because you were. I know, like when you got to Valdosta, people were just just flabbergasted that this guy is going to throw <laughs> the footballs down here in SEC country. Where did yeah, where did that be? Thought geography had something to do with throwing a ball. <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong though? Like they thought you were no, crazy. You were right. I mean, yeah. we, You know, we get down there. And Sam tells a story really good in the book about how they. Uh, <laughs> We put on a coaching clinic that had this who's who the lineups of NFL and college coaches, and zero people showed up. <laughs> and we so we just sat around and clinicked ourselves for two days. Uh, but no, the, the high school coaches had wanted nothing to do with us, and uh, and the fans were kind of the same way. Uh, we were being kind of mocked all over town, and uh, it was my son is now the offensive coordinator at Colorado State. Yep. And Matt was a, at that point a sophomore in high school and was going to play quarterback for Valdosta High, the winningest high school program in the nation. And their head coach there told us quite proudly when we enrolled him that we don't have any dummies here. We only hit live meat. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Which appalled Matthew's mother quite a bit. <laughs> but he, uh, it was great for him, though. It toughened him up for sure. But they, So uh, where did it come from, Lee? Were you, I'm sorry. Were you an outlaw growing up? Were you kind of a guy who cut against the grain? Where did this come from? Well, I was played receiver, and you know, I think the essence of it. I was lucky in the in the early '70s to play for a couple of coaches that did that. And and in high school, we threw the ball, and and I learned the the importance of. Uh, chemistry between quarterback and receiver we would go to thomas jefferson high school in the afternoons all summer long and and play catch and run routes and then when i went to college I, the naval academy recruited me but they did in right after graduation they told me you're going to new mexico military for a year so they put me over there and we had this great old coach named bob dennis who was really a fantastic guy and, and he just loved the passing game. He'd been in, in coaching in uh, Canada in the CFL for a long time, where they had where they had probably at that point in time had the greatest tradition of throwing the ball. And so he was determined to do that for uh, us little uh, nine million marching idiots at NIMI. <laughs> so we we did. We threw it all over the park, and uh, Coach Dennis would would. Uh, he, he dressed, he wore a fedora hat and a, a trench coat and he smoked cigarettes on the sidelines. 
and he uh, he'd school. walk up and down. Yeah. If the offensive coordinator called a run play, he'd yell at him. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I just I just was fortunate to be around that, and then you know I, I finished at Tarleton, and we didn't we were more of a conventional offense there, and I played receiver, and I had one pretty good season there that that where we, I think I caught like twenty five balls or something, which everybody you know was good enough to get you ranked in the Lone Star Conference, uh, but you know for us uh, i mean that just for a guy that liked catching the ball and running routes and seeing the ball in the air that just wasn't what i wanted to do and so when i went into coaching i i i was at moody high school in corpus christi texas and the second year i believe it was the second year i coached i was coaching the quarterbacks and receivers and i'll never forget on saturday morning i walked out and picked up the newspaper and Emory Ballard was coaching Texas A&M, and they were the number one team in the nation, or number two, something like that. This is like maybe the second or third week of September. And I walk out and pick up the newspaper. There's a big headline, A&M upset by some school called BYU. Hmm. And I read the article, and it talked about how BYU threw the ball all the time. And I just put that mental note in the back of my head and that I wanted to find out what they were doing. And so for the next couple of years, every time I'd go to a clinic, if Coach Edwards was speaking, I would go listen to him. And, and he was so great at, at what they did and had started turning out all these quarterbacks like Mark Wilson and Gifford Nielsen and, and then Jim McMahon, you know, and Steve mm-hmm. Young. It just this long, incredible run of quarterbacks. Well, Three years later, I got the job to be the quarterback and receiver coach at West Texas State. And again, we're we're stuck in an offense that is, you know, I'm teaching guys to stock block and, and uh, working on pass routes after practice because we didn't put much time into it during practice. And uh, the first year I was there, we we played Jimmy Johnson at Oklahoma State. And Oklahoma State was, at that time, y'all were the big eight. And Oklahoma State had had a great year, and they were picked to be co-favorites in that conference. And they they paid us money to come over and, and, and get our butts kicked for the for their opening game. Mm-hmm. And we went over there, and, and we had figured out that uh, they only played two coverages. And they – they would either play cover three or cover two. If they played cover three, we could just have our quarterback raise up and throw a quick pass to the wide receiver. And, and he could, you know, we, we could make yards. If they played cover two, we'd take that same wide receiver and release him outside in the seam between the corner and the safety. And we'd put the, put somebody else out in the flat to occupy the, the corner. And, and we would get a hole, what they call a hole throw. Uh, in front of the safety and behind the corner. And we just did that over and over again, <laughs> all the way down the field, and we ended up winning the game. Crazy. And we had one of the best passing days that, that West Texas had ever had, which really isn't saying very much, because <laughs> if you threw for more than 200 yards, they, were, they thought it was incredible. Uh, but we want, we beat a big-time team, you know. And so <laughs> after that, the head coach started listening to me, and, and uh, we kind of gradually – opened our offense up and the next year we won a bunch of games and bill young got the who was a great guy and uh he gets the job at utep and he makes me the offensive coordinator well we had utep was much like i wesleyan was when i got there they were they were really bad and had no no facilities and no players and uh after four years we had recruited very good and I had followed, we had followed BYU through the schedule. So I had gradually taken our offense from being a run oriented deal to more of a balanced attack where we could throw the ball. And we copied a lot of stuff BYU did. And the last year we were there in uh, 1985, BYU had won the national championship the year before. And they had everybody back and they were ranked. 
I, mean, I think they were one in one poll and three in another poll. About mid-season, they came to El Paso, and, and we upset them. And we did it using a lot of stuff they did. They did. Yeah. Well, at the end of that year, we got the best thing that ever happened to me in coaching was I got fired at UTEP. So, after the season was over, the, some of the assistants from UTEP or from BYU came up to me and they said, "What are you going to do?" And I said, "Well, I'm I'm trying to get a head coaching job. I want to be the I want to be the boss." And they said, "Well, you know, Mike Holmgren just left our staff to go to the 49ers. He said Coach Edwards would probably like to talk to you about." taking his spot and and I said well I appreciate it guys but I think I'm going to do this this uh, high school AD job I, I you know I loved what they did on the football field but but I'm we, we raised our kids Catholic and <laughs> I like yeah. to drink bourbon and smoke cigars I wasn't going to fit in too good in Provo <laughs> Utah and I kind of figured my kids probably wouldn't either and and, uh, I always so, wondered that. I'm glad you said that. I always wondered why you didn't coach at BYU because it seemed yeah, like no, such I, a natural I, fit. It, well, it, I had a chance to, but I, I just I knew enough from all of their staff, having been around them for a few years, that, that I love the guys, and and I ended up hiring one of them on my staff. But uh, it just wasn't be it wasn't going to be a fit. And I really, I really wanted. I had in my head what I wanted to do. And I just need a place to do it. So Copper's Cove was it. And uh, so, so that's how you ask how it all started. That that was how it, it was just like this whole decade of of uh, taking what I had done that I enjoyed as a player and then trying to put it together so that, that uh, kids would play. And the other thing about the – in the mid-'80s, we were losing – we were losing the best athletes to other sports. Oh yeah. And like when I got to Copper's Cove, there was four great athletes on, on campus. All of them were African American and all of them did not play football. They played basketball. They played soccer. They played baseball. Yeah. Uh, so I called them in and I asked them why they didn't play football. I said, well, football wasn't fun. I said, well, it's going to be fun here. You're going to like this. And I showed them some film of BYU and some film of uh, that I had from the, the run and shoot people. And I said, that could be you, and this could be you, and this could be you. And and uh, they all agreed to play. I said, I'll still let you play your other sports, but hmm. we need you to play football, and it'll be fun. And four so, years, three years later when I left, they were the all-district all quarterback, all-district two all district receivers and one all state receiver. That's what's so fascinating about air raid to me, because when I look at you and I look at coach Leach, I, I really always noted this about Leach and it's what I always admire about him when he's at Kansas, he's at Texas tech. This is where he's a head coach. Yeah. Um, Oklahoma doesn't win a national championship probably without him going and installing air True. raid in, in 2000. True. And then Mark Mangino takes over. Wins well, that they national title. Mangino to see me. I, I actually coached Mangino and those guys up for a whole, a whole. Uh, really? Spring. Okay. And, and again, I didn't know that the, they flew us in. They flew us into Miami for the national championship game. To wow. Help game plan that. Okay, so Mike's in Lubbock, Texas. He's in Pullman, Washington. And I always said when he was at Washington State, I wanted him to go to the SEC so bad because yeah. I wanted him to bring air raid to the, you know, the yeah. good old boys club down there. And he does in his first game, he beats LSU. Um, oh, that's fantastic. Wasn't it? Oh, it was the greatest. Well, that's the was... typical deal that, that people always did. See in the big 12, you guys at one point when Mike was later in his career at Texas tech, I think out of y'all's, well, what is it like nine out of 10 teams were running air raid or a form of it. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so you know they knew how to defense it. In in the SEC, it'd been a while since I'd been at Kentucky, and and uh, they all fell asleep. He had all these coaching changes. Nobody knew how to how to defense it. So he goes down to LSU, and of course their their first thought is, well, we'll just blitz them. Well, that's like the worst thing you can 
do. <laughs> yeah. So they tried to blitz him, and he ends up setting the setting you, SEC total game record, you know? When you're sitting there and watching these SEC games and even the NFL now, I mean, I, I remember, I think, Coach, and I don't know this for a fact, but I, I'm a big Minnesota Vikings fan. He's used to go up yeah. to games all the time. I swear to God, I was at the first Patriots game when they ran air raid and Brady dropped back in the shotgun and they were five wide. It was on Monday night football and they put up like 50 points on us, just embarrassed us. This was yeah. in the earlier mid 2000s. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, it. there's got to be a part of you, coach, that can kick your feet up and have that cigar and the bourbon and be like, you know what? Screw you. Screw you. Screw you. Because all these people would mock you, and they'd say it's not real football. And now if you turn on the TV on a Saturday or a Sunday, there is air raid in uh, just about every game. Well, I'll give you a good example. This has happened about – I was at New Mexico State. Mike was still at Texas Tech. It was probably about 2006 or so. And we're watching those same Patriots. And – uh they're playing the Dolphins, and they're raising up and throwing the ball. The Dolphins are laying off the wide receivers, so they're just raising up and throwing the little quick screens out there to them. And then we look up, and there's there's a they throw mesh, which is the perfect pass. That's what the, the book the, the play yep. the yep. book's named after. And so I call up Mike and I go, are you watching this a Monday night game? I, said, I call him out. Are you watching this game? And he goes, yeah, I am. I said, you remember when Guy Morris left our staff at, at uh, Valdosta State and went with Buddy Ryan to the Cardinals? And he called back and said he almost got fired. And Mike goes, <laughs> yeah, I remember that. And Guy had left us and Buddy Ryan hired him. And uh, Guy calls one, is in, like in the spring. And guy calls and he says, uh, "Well, I almost got fired today." I said, "Why? It's only it's only May." <laughs> and he goes, he says, uh, he says we're trying to figure out how to block seven with five. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I keep telling him, "Look, if the corner's that far off the wide receiver, why don't we just raise up and throw it to him?" Yeah. And he said, "The first time I said it, nobody said anything, and then I said it again." And, Buddy Ryan looked at him and said, if you say that one more time, I'm going to fire you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like 19, uh, probably 1995 or 90, no, 93, something like that. No, 95 probably. And uh, so here it was 10 years later and the Patriots are doing the NFL. And I, I, I reminded Mike of that story, and he goes, yeah. He said, you know, Wes Welker, I'm pretty sure Wes Welker is the offensive coordinator of the Patriots. Because oh. he's at the call here for film all the time. And that, oh, so yeah, because he was in the yeah. slot there for Brady. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and he was a great one. And uh, Wes was one of those guys that when you saw him, first time I ever met him, we were I'd gone to Texas Tech to visit. And Mike says, you want to go watch Bobby Knight's team play basketball? And I said, yeah. So we're walking through the parking lot, and this little kid comes up and talks to Mike. And and when it's done, I go, "Who was that? Your manager?" He goes, "No, that's Wes Welker." <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, like, <laughs> is, coach is the glory of air raid because, like, I look around now and, like, I, I mean, like, for me, here's one example, and like, I think BYU should be running like a pure air raid going into the Big Twelve, like, I. The, I guess my I guess my question, and then I'll maybe give an opinion or two after, is did you design it based on like, hey, for for a place, you know, like Leach and Lubbock, right? We're we're not going to have the best talent, but it's going to allow us to compete no matter what. Oh sure, yeah. Is that is I mean, is that the genesis of Air Raid? Yeah, of course. And and Lavelle Edwards said it best when when I used to go visit. And he became the head coach at BYU because nobody else wanted the job. They'd only had one winning season in like 50 years. Wow. And, and this is the early 70s. And I asked him, I said, Coach, how did you, how did you do this? Because at that point, uh, this is in the mid, mid to late 80s when I was out there visiting. And they were really the only team in college football that was throwing the ball around. 
I mean, consistently every year. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, nobody paid any attention to them. Everybody made fun of them too. And I, I was just a, enough of a rebel to want to be just like them. <laughs> so I asked coach, why, how'd you do this? And he looked at me, he goes, you know how we, as we got better, we resisted the temptation to become conservative. He said, you know, we would see, you would watch these coaches and they go in and they don't have any players. So they throw the ball around for a couple of years and then they go out and recruit good players and they get a tailback and they get a fullback and, you know, and then pretty soon they they don't, can't throw the ball anymore. And that, that's one of the wisest things I'd ever heard. You know? and, huh? and, uh, that's, that's exactly what happens to, you know, I mean, you, you, you can throw the ball all you want to, but you have to work on it. You have to practice it. You have to have a way to practice it. You have to way, have a way to game plan it. Well, if, if you go recruit a tailback and a fullback and, and you spend all your time working on on uh, ISO and speed option, well, that's what you're going to be. Yeah. You, you, can't, you can't throw the ball because you didn't work on throwing the ball. And and that's what he was saying. And it's I, I took that to heart, and, that, and it just has always stuck with me. And that's why we, we've never really changed a lot of things. We still do things now the same way we – you know, I coached in the spring league two springs. Mm -hmm. ago. We won the championship. The practices in the spring league were just like the practices at Iowa Wesleyan, and uh, just like they were at Kentucky. Uh, we we just don't change very much. Of all we, your pro, I, of all your proteges that are out there right now, running yeah, we, air raid. We we just figured out how many reps you got to do at each thing to to make it successful on game day, and if you deviate from that. <laughs> You're, you're not going to be successful. It's why NFL has a lot of, most of the NFL offenses don't work because they have too many plays. Mm. They're, they're trying to call the perfect play for the perfect situation. And so they got a hundred options. Well, I dare anybody in any endeavor in life to get a hundred options and try and consider it and figure out which one to pick in 25 seconds. It's, it's not going to happen. So, the only teams that win are the ones that let the quarterbacks control control things because nobody sees it better than the quarterback. And that's what Mike understood, and he understood that. That's what I always understood. And so our, our offenses are, have always been quarterback friendly. And when we started playing fast, that was the biggest challenge at Iowa Wesleyan with Dustin Dewall was uh, making the menu for plays for him short enough so that he could make a quick decision and then having a, a fallback play that he could run if he didn't have a decision. And, and that way the quarterback can see who he can see where the leverage of the defense is and how to get the ball to him. And yeah. Cause when I was young and dumb covering the big 12 early on in my career, I would always think like, Oh, Kingsbury's gone. Texas tech's going to really drop off this year. Yeah. And that was never really the case for you and Mike because it was really more of the – it was less about your physical attributes and more about your knowledge of the right. the air raid, right? I mean, right. and, and you, you know, completion percentage was the key. Yeah. Yeah, you got to keep – you got to keep the ball in play, you know. Just keep the ball alive. And, and uh, as long as you're throwing completions and making first downs, you're going to be successful. We only have a few more minutes here. I wanted to look just at football right now with you, and I also want to promote your camps and all this great stuff. We have a great idea, me and Aiden. We were talking about it earlier. Um, I, I think I want to become Air Raid certified. Oh, cool. <laughs> How cool would that be? Yeah, it would be cool. I, uh, go out and get me like a middle school team, and we're going to start chucking it around here in, in central Iowa. What do you think about yeah, that? No, I think you should do it. Send me a – let me know when you do it. I'll, I'll get you a, a discount on the thing. <laughs> okay. It's, pretty popular. it's a pretty popular. We've got over 900 coaches that have done it. I uh, saw that. Yeah, it's a, there's a huge list. We've actually had you. You would actually be the second sports reporter. Really? Type person that would do it. We've had two NFL coaches do it. Um, yeah, the first one's a young lady named Chrissy Freud who covered Mike for a number of years, and she, she got real interested in it. 
she wrote a lot for uh, Sports Illustrated and The Athletic and stuff like that. But yeah, she she did it. Uh, yeah, it, it's a well, it's, it's just it's a course. It's just a lecture course, and and uh, but there's three tests. You got to pass the test. I'm saying. doing this next year, next off season. I don't think I got well, time now. Next yeah. off season. Yeah. Airraidcertified.com. You guys can go and check this out. We have a lot of high school coaches and stuff in the area who, who will be listening to this. So check it out. I, 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 I'm curious, coach, like, where do you think football is going? Uh, because like in the big 12, for instance, it feels like we're going back in time a little bit. Well, I'm we a little have... worried about the rule changes they've got this year. I, I think the, the, the defensive mentality guys, have taken over the rules committee. Oh no. And you're going to see shorter games, less plays and less scoring. And, and not because of the type of offense. I don't think the offenses are going to change. I think they're just going to keep doing what they're doing. They, because the guys want less of it. And so I think they're going to, much like if you watched any of the XFL or the USFL games, uh, I got friends that coach in those leagues, and one of them was an offense coordinator. He told me in the XFL, they, out of the ten games they played in five of them, they only had three three possessions in the first half. Wow. Five times. I, so I, I think that's what's going to happen, but it's not because of the offenses. It's because of the clock and, and just less plays. But I think the offenses are going to keep doing what they're doing. Uh, and it's – I don't think you can go back. It, you're going to lose your fan base at most places if you go back to ground and pound all the time. And more importantly, you're going to you're going to go back to losing those athletes. Yeah. You look at you look, what point. we did at Copper's Cove and Iowa Wesley in, in the in the mid to, mid '80s to mid '90s was more importantly about the players we could get. And and they how you how you play the game. I mean, if you try to play the game in a run oriented style all the time, then you have to uh, you have to go back to that that okay. Let's pl- start every practice with Oklahoma drill mentality. And and I don't think our young people in this day and age are going to put up with that. They're just that's not a good play. point. They're, they're just not going to play. There's too many other things for them to do. If if you're an athletic director, last question for you, Coach. Sure. And it's football only. That's all we're talking about. Yeah. And you could hire any current college head coach, or maybe not a head coach. Who who would you want to lead your program? Um. Well, that's that's a tough one. But I'll tell you, the guy who is is probably the best football coach nobody knows about right now is Chris Hatcher. Oh, he's an old quarterback of yours, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And I, I have to be a little bit one-sided here. I also hire my son. Yeah. Because Matthew has, has done a – he's done a fabulous job everywhere he's been. And uh, he, he's flying a little bit under the radar, but he's he's the assistant head coach and runs the offense at Colorado State. And uh, I, th- those two guys right there are the two I'd pick. That, okay. That, uh, well, I, coach, there, there's a bunch of other great ones out there, but they already most of them already have great jobs. <laughs> you know, I could have done four hours with you. I really appreciate your time and and condolences on the loss of Coach Leach as well. I didn't really know him, but I kind of like I said, he he's been an inspiration to me as a view for a really long time. Of, I tell my daughter, my eight year old daughter, she's 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 an interesting kid. Her, her her karate and podcasting are her hobbies. And I'm like, right. it's okay to be weird. That's what I always tell her. Just be different and be yourself. And you guys always did that. It's, it's more than the football thing. I just, I've always appreciated how you guys will just cut against the grain and you don't necessarily need to blend in with everyone else. So thank no, you for that. It's, it's, uh, you just have to be yourself. And, and I, I think that's true in any, anything in life, not just football. All right. Well, I'm going to be getting in touch with you in the next few months because I'm doing air. I'm going to get air raid certified next year. All right. Well, everybody do that. (laughs) That's my New Year's resolution for myself already. (laughs) 
there you go. We we have a we have a big uh, Black Friday sale in November, so I'll tell you. Oh, why perfect. Present. Yeah, there you go. We we also get a bunch of guys signed up then. Um, but I appreciate you having me on, Chris. Yeah, Coach, if you ever want to relive and uh, talk about the past, I'm your guy. I'll have you on anytime. I love it. So, thank well, you, sir. I appreciate doing it. This international uh, a lot, football alliance, and we're starting this pro league and in uh mexico in the u.s so we're i've been doing that for about nine months now so I'll are you ever going to retire no I, I never really worked <laughs> <laughs> what would i do <laughs> that's true yeah we'll, we'll, we'll have, have to start you a podcast if you ever want yeah. one yeah <laughs> but anyway yeah well I'll, I'll i'll get i'll reach out to you we'll get on and talk about that so after we sounds get great yeah any any once you get that going reach out and we'll we'll be here to help you guys with the publicity all right appreciate it chris thank you much thank you very much sir yeah the great hal mummy here uh it's been awesome to have him on with us today